We wanted to um, focus the plenary session on a panel discussion of career issues uh, because, as you've seen from reading the press, this is certainly something that's uh, important in the minds of most engineers with the current trend toward restructuring, downsizing, outsourcing, uh, shamrock organizations, the uh, other things that uh, are new since the end of the Cold War and uh, the future of engineers' careers. Uh, we have a nice panel, I think, uh, lined up for you. Uh, I'd like to introduce the, the panelists. Uh, Paul Kostak is uh, Vice Chair of the Career Policy Council and Chairman of the uh, Career Maintenance and Development uh, Committee. Uh, <laughs> hold your applause. <laughs> Peggy Hutchison has been uh, a stalwart in uh, the Careers Conference and always brings keen insights uh, to her talk. She'll be talking on engineering your career. Uh, she's the, uh, I guess could we call it the CEO of the Odyssey Group? or? Uh, well, we can call it that. <laughs> All right, okay. And uh, John Hoshea, uh, title of his uh, talk is the same as the title of his book, uh, Career Advancement and Survival for Engineers, so I think you'll be very interested in what he has to say. Uh, this is the first time we've had a joint collective effort with the uh, Engineering Activities Board, and we have Dan Jackson uh, representing uh, uh, professional, get it right here, professional Development Committee, uh, talking about the ways IEEE can assist you in keeping your career current. Um, Scott, if you'd put the first slide up, I just want to give you a little stage setting here uh, for what we're getting into. There's good news and there's bad news. The good news is you're seeing some headlines, uh, this is just from last week, uh, that yeah, there is a demand for engineers. Uh, the story says Silicon Graphics is looking for 3,000 new engineers. Silicon Graphics has done a pretty good job of shifting from the uh, Cold War to the uh, peace dividend. Uh, they've been working in Jurassic Park instead of uh, Star Wars, uh, ABM type systems. But put the next one up. This is the type of engineer that uh, Silicon Graphics is looking for. I think you'll notice that uh, she's 20 something and the demand is for young engineers that know C++ and uh, the other things that you get straight out of school uh, that you've got all the current credentials. Put the uh, next one up, if you will. The bad news is that uh, a large fraction of us don't fit that uh, description. There is a new issue of the uh, Regional Review of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. This chart uh, comes from an article called End Games, Planning for the End of One's Career. And this chart is based on uh, Census Department data. Uh, Larry Grayson alluded to it yesterday in another talk. Uh, green is women, red is men, but what it shows there in the middle, you can see on the left-hand side, every five years of age is a separate uh, bar, and it shows that the percent of the workforce between the ages of uh, 50 and 65 is going to increase as the boomers age and, and uh, move through the normal life cycle. In fact, it goes up by about 50% between 1995 and the year 2005 and about another 25% uh, between 2005 and 2015. The uh, article in Games points out that uh, right now people are having problems uh, staying in their careers past age 50. That uh, downsizing is uh, hitting principally the higher paid individuals at that age. Uh, managers have twice as high a probability of being used out as professionals or technical people. Uh, you know, just leave that up there. That tells you how you can get the publication for free if you're interested. There's a phone number there. You can also get on the subscription list. But part of the problem was what happened in the 80s because we had uh, good stock market performance during the Reagan years. Pension funds uh, had a pretty good return and as a result a lot of companies found they had enough money they could sweeten the offer and start offering these early retirement uh, packages, which you've read so much about. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield was one of the first ones to do that. By adding five years to age and five years to service, uh, they could make it attractive for people to move out. Uh, some of the people that did move out wound up going back to school, uh, recycling, but getting a different uh, career and finishing up uh, um, the last 15 or 20 years of their uh, working life that way. At the same time that the uh, population segment in the upper age brackets is increasing, as you know, the age at which you can draw full, full Social Security is also increasing up to 67 
uh, by 2001. So we have a problem at the end of the career, and I think there's motivation there for this entire audience to uh, pick up all the tips you can on how you can keep yourself viable through lifelong learning uh, to maintain a, a career that's both uh, satisfying and economically rewarding for you over your entire span from uh, college to uh, retirement. Uh, we'll start the panel now. Is that you want to talk first, or Peggy? I'm just moderating. <laughs> okay, and I'm not turn, singing. Turn it over to uh, Paul, who will moderate but not sing. Good morning. One of the perks of being chair is I don't have to pre pre present anything. So, uh, what we'll be doing for the format here is each of our speakers will have 10 minutes, and once we wrap up with the presentations, we'll have time for any questions you might have. We'll be starting with Peggy Hutchison. She's the president of the Odyssey Group. I won't go into the bios of all the speakers. They're all in the backs of your books. Uh, Peggy's also a member of the Career Maintenance and Development Committee, and she will be chairing next year's Careers Conference. Peggy? The Odyssey Group is a brand new 20-year-old company. It actually was launched on September the 1st this year, and it's an outgrowth of a business that's been going on since 1975. We believe that uh, this change in our business and our business practices is exemplary of the kind of thing that's happening to individuals and to companies all over the world. Because we have found that as we've grown and matured, instead of finding that we wanted to do the same things and do them in, in different ways, that there are radical new things that we need to do. I want this morning to take just a couple of minutes to challenge you to think about some of the things that you might believe if you do them more or do them better, can help you in your business or your career and see if some ideas come that might make some, some shifts. I have found, as I've been working with particularly engineering groups over the last 10 years, but throughout the last 20 years that I've been working in career development, that there's a concept that's really different today, and it's the dress for success. I don't know how many of you are around in the 70s when dress for success was kind of the hot thing, and we all had to dress kind of like this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then if you, unless you went to California in the late 80s and then you started looking more like Paul looks. Um, well, I believe that the real dress for success in, in today's economy is the rubber suit because bouncing back is the most powerful skill that any of us can have. So when you think about getting dressed um, and prepared physically to do the work that you want to do and need to do and the work that's going to benefit your business. Think about how often you need to, uh, that you actually come against a wall and when you hit that wall, how often do we bounce back or do we just kind of retreat? So that's one of the challenges that we have. I believe that um, another challenge that we have is in our search for security. When you look at the graphs like we just did about the aging workforce and we think about, ooh, pension funds and how long will I be at work or will I even be at work anymore? So often we go, ooh, I've got to find a place where I can know that I can stay. Well, I believe that the place is, uh, that that's a, a misplaced search because the challenge is not to find a place where you can be secure, but for you to be secure enough to be able to find a place. It's a subtle shift, but a powerful one. Um, third place that I believe we need to kind of make a little shift in our thinking is the, um, around the new skills employees want, employers want. When you saw the woman in the 20-something slide, the kind of engineer that people are looking for. A lot of you went probably inside, if not outside, oh yeah, yeah, we see that all the time. Well, organizations often are not just looking for fewer workers. They're looking for different workers. So instead of saying, yeah, I'm not like them, uh, I challenge you to think about how, in what ways you can be more like them. What is it that organizations are looking for that make those kinds of 20-something workers especially appealing to them? 
It's often not a matter of um, age or experience or salary that means people need to go. I work with companies that are having some really tough decisions because their hearts say, we want to keep the people that we have, and their heads say, and we can't be competitive unless these people are radically retooled for the work that we need to do. So that kind of shift I encourage you to make. Um, the crisis now that we're finding, that I keep finding over and over in organizations, is how to help people like you, like me, like all the people that we work with, connect in meaningful ways to the work that's there. And that comes out of the issue that I just talked about. How do we find meaning in our work when work is changing all the time around us? How can we grasp it long enough and hard enough and find enough places to put our hearts into it so that it's meaningful to us? Um, there are three points that I believe can help you get there. And the first is to know what's meaningful to you. Uh, one of the bestseller books over the last two or three years is Stephen Covey's Seven Habits. If some of you have seen that or run into it, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. No? Um, a few of you know it. Okay. In there, um, one of the things that uh, he represents is that the only way that we are actually going to be able to deal with the kind of change that's happening in our world today is by finding our unchangeable core to find out what is meaning for us. And that's one way of finding how to gain your own security, to find out what is meaningful for you. Another thing that you might do is to examine some of your beliefs about careers and career paths. Uh, when I say career path, people either get this picture of, oh yeah, you used to could advance, and we think of the ladder marching up the organization, but there's no such thing as a career path anymore. I can't tell you how many times I hear that. And there really are career paths, but our ability to redesign organizations uh, is so much farther along than our ability to rethink careers in those organizations that the challenge is for us to rethink, okay, what are the new career paths? Maybe it's concurrent careers. We talk a lot about concurrent engineering. Or concentric careers. Think of having multiple careers in one single pattern. Or maybe it's contingency careers, where I have primaries, secondaries, and even tertiary things that I'm doing and working on and learning about as a way of developing my career. Um, and the final thing, in addition to finding what's meaningful to you and examining your beliefs, third thing that I want you to um, be aware of is to recognize that new career times, and these are new career times, call for continuous exploration. Uh, you're here at a conference. You're learning and you're sharing and you're gathering lots of information. Uh, being it, a part of a learning organization means making yourself a learning organization as well. When you hear ideas, instead of pushing back or bouncing off, uh, think of being in that rubber suit that, ju that is so resilient that it takes the best and finds new directions, new ways to go from that. One of the things that IEEE is making available to you, in addition to this conference and some workshops that are available, is the Careers Conference next April in Minneapolis. It's uh, Thursday and Friday, April 11th and 12th. We'll have, be having a conference that is helping engineers develop career resilience, where for two days we can go in depth into each of these areas. So if they're particularly interesting to you, if there are things here that are you're wondering about in your career, or maybe it's even how to help others manage careers in your organization, or how to give guidance in your uh, section, then we encourage you to come to that. Our next speaker is John Hoche. He is a member of the Career Maintenance and Development Committee. Some of you may recognize his name from the series of articles, excerpts from his book that appeared in Spectrum Magazine. And John's topic this morning is Career Advancement and Survival for Engineers. John. Thank you. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to share an observation I had yesterday walking around that uh, old village. I walked into one of the buildings and they had an office there. And I walked in the office and I looked and I thought, hmm, Kind of plain, no color in the walls, nothing much on the walls, a corner and a desk, oh, desk looks very old. 
It looks uh, like it's been really used. And I looked at the chair. Hmm. Looks like I've been through two world wars, you know, kind of used, and all the equipment was archaic. And suddenly I felt this uh, homesick urge, and I realized, hey, that looks like my office. <laughs> <laughs> the sad feeling that I had when leaving the office was that it had a modern convenience that mine doesn't, had, does not have. It had a beautiful window. So um, I'm here to talk about uh, career resilience. And maybe a good uh, example of why we need to develop that is my own personal experience. I'd like to share that with you. I uh, spent 14 years with Honeywell devoting my life to uh, uh, developing uh, science and technology for them in the defense systems group. And I was a first line supervisor and had a group of about uh, eight to 10 engineers. I worked for the company for 14 years and the last year before I was laid off, I uh, was a project leader on a project where we uh, won $250,000 worth of bonuses for the company. It turned out to be uh, about 80% of the profits for the division at that time. And uh, about one month before I was laid off, um, the pres vice president of the division came down and gave me a $750 check along with every member of my team that was on it. So we were all excited. The day before I got laid off, program manager walked in my office and says, oh, John, don't worry, you're too valuable. They'll never lay you off. And the next morning, uh, my supervisor called me in and said, John, I have some bad news for you. We're downsizing. We're getting out of the business that you're in. And I'm sorry, but you're laid off. And I was completely in shock. I thought at that point, I was a great engineer. Great engineers never get laid off. Wrong, wrong answer. So uh, everybody needs to develop career resilience. Uh, I'm speaking about uh, once a month at career centers. And let me tell you, there's a lot of talent out there, a lot of talent at these outplacement career centers on the road. And you need to take uh, control of your life. And career resilience really starts with you. How many people in here get up every morning and start uh, working career resilience for somebody else? Can I see your hands? Nobody, right? Oh, there's a couple. Great. Um, probably a professor or helping mentoring some junior students. But what you got to realize is that career resilience is not something that someone else is going to do for you. It starts with you. You need to take the first step and take control of your career. You need to understand that no one out there is looking out for you, and real career resilience starts here, inward. Another thing I want to stress, career resilience is success comes in cans, failure comes in cans. I cannot get over. Uh, when I'm at these outplacement centers, the uh, engineers that do survive, that are resilient, that go on and bounce back, as Peggy says, have a positive can-do attitude. I can learn this. I can go out and interview, and I can do these things. The engineers that are stuck there two, three, four years uh, without finding a job are the ones that come in and, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this, you know? And they talk themselves into cans. Finally, failing to plan is simply planning to fail. If you don't have a plan, your plan for career resilience, you're planning to fail. Let me show you how positive, give you an example, a coworker of mine, uh, how planning can make a difference. He was also a frontline supervisor like, like myself, and his group got laid off on one wave, and we were going through waves of layoffs. Does that sound familiar? About every six, eight months? Anyway, his group laid off on the last wave, but they kept him, so he knew he was next on the chopping block. So rather than sticking his head in the sand and, and thinking that they would, he would survive, he got proactive. He got his resume up to date, he went out and interviewed, and he actually found a job. He scheduled the job to start two weeks after, uh, the, after the wave, the next wave came. To make a long story short, sure enough, he was on the wave, he was laid off, and at that time they were given two weeks severance pay for every uh, year of service. He had 15 years of service. So because of his uh, aggr uh, aggressiveness and planning, he walked out the door with a with a 30-week bonus package, a two-week paid vacation, and he started a new job with a 5% raise, and it was closer to his house. Now that's career resilience. And it's all because he got active and he took control. You can make the difference for the members if you take the information back that you've seen and share it with them. I'd like to talk a little bit about the many factors contributing to career resilience and what's stopping your career growth. I can't get into all these in detail. I'm just going to go around them quickly. Obsolescence. Obsolescence is key. If you look back uh, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, obsolescence or burnout or uh, 
was about uh, 10 years for the engineer. Now it's down to five years. I have a slide rule in a glass case on my wall in my office, and, under, and underneath it, it says, in case of uh, hard disk failure or power failure, break glass. And, and I, I thought everybody understood it. I've actually had engineers come in and say, what's that thing? <laughs> uh, personality. Remember, you're a person, you're dealing with people, and personality plays a good role. Are you good at handling crisis? Are you keeping tempered? Remember, when you're getting into the point where you're in a dangerous situation and downsizing, you've got to learn to keep your cool. Poor training does not contribute to career resilience, but good training does. Educational level. Are you returning? Are you updating your skills? In my case, it was a poor, poor business climate that uh, led to my uh, layoff. Uh, ultimately, this, the uh, decision resides with your supervisor. Have you looked at your relationship lately with your supervisor? Is it good? Are you and him or her fighting all the time? If you're fighting, you, you need to really consider that that's a serious career uh, imp impediment. Finally, you need to look at your company. What's your company doing? What's the structure of your company? What's your department? Are you in a key department uh, that's vital to the company? Or are you in a support group that can easily be out job to a, an independent? You need to consider all these factors. And the bottom line here is crew resilience is just not being a good engineer anymore. It's considering all the factors that you need to take into effect. <coughs> Another way to develop career resistance is to uh, career, career resilience is to stop and don't become involved in why do engineers fail. If you stop and think about it, our uh, standards for the engineering school often end up with the top one quarter of the high school graduating class. This is the cream of the crop coming into engineering. And you would think that engineers would dominate the fields and in industry out there, but why they don't? And what a lot of people don't realize is that engineers fail more often than they realize. Uh, don't quote me on this, but I heard a statistic that 15 years out of, out of engineering school, about half the engineers have left the profession. Why? These are brilliant engineers, what's going on? Well, if you look at the root causes, basically they're human skills related. And I'm not going to go through these, but if you look at the six listed there, the top three are what we call it the soft skills or people skills. And they're listed primarily in order of why engineers fail. This is uh, data that we took out of our uh, H when I worked with our HR department with Honeywell. Uh, inept or poor communications, poor relations with the supervisor, and inflexibility. Engineers inflexible? Nah. Uh, and the final four are deal with your technical skills. So you need to consider that when you consider career resilience, all the factors that contributed, you need to take a total systems integrated approach. So in summary, career resilience starts with you taking charge and having a plan. Remember, if you don't have a plan, if you're sitting there thinking, I'm a good engineer, nothing's going to happen to me. Boy, that's not planning. That's planning for failure. There's many factors uh, in career development and career resilience. It goes beyond being a good engineer. Avoid the root causes for engineering failures. Identify them. Be honest with yourself. Look at your last appraisal. What were your low areas? What were your high areas? Don't ignore those deficit areas, or deficiency areas, as we call them. You can develop pure resilience, but it takes effort and planning. It's a high energy state. It's not a low energy state. Thanks. He's chairing the Educational Activities Board's Professional Development Committee. It's a committee that uh, this the Career Maintenance Committee of USAP has been work, starting to work closely with. And Dan will be talking about resources for resilient careers. and John Moshe about engineering your career and 
career resilience, I'm here to tell you a little bit about the resources which are available to you. Of course, in a few minutes that are allotted to me, there's no way I can cover all these resources. Since I'm involved with continuing education and professional development in the IEEE, I will concentrate on those areas. But first, let me review briefly the many sources and many forms of continuing education. Here are listed some of the sources from which we all can get some amount of continuing education. And I'm sure with a little thought that you can come up with even more sources of continuing education. And of course, these different sources do provide different forms and different types and levels of continuing education. Okay, the, the many forms, and I somehow we missed a slide in here. Uh, the forms I had listed are uh, books, tutorials, and news articles. Uh, we've seen some news articles shown earlier. Uh, conferences, seminars, workshops such as this, uh, videos, TV programs, and each of these forms listed, of course, has if it's different types of information, has its own advantages. And how many of these forms have you taken advantage of? And there are certainly other forms that you can think of without any difficulty. These are things that the IEEE, uh, various uh, activities and, uh, that the IEEE has to help you in continuing education to help in your resilient careers. There's many groups within the IEEE that provide in one form or another various types of uh, continuing education and professional development opportunities. This shows many of the IEEE ones, but there's one obvious omission which I left up there purposely, and that's the IEEE Press who puts out books on various subjects. Your presence here this weekend, your participation in this workshop, which is provided by the U.S. Activities PACE, is professional development. Next slide. The resources within the IEEE uh, are from the many providers. They're different resources. The education activities provides publications, also provides self-study courses, videos, volunteer activities, and starting last year, workshops. In 1994, the Educational Activities Board sponsored Industry 2000, which is a workshop on technical vitality through continuing education and available either in the back of the hall or in the foyer is a uh, printed proceedings uh, called Technical Vitality Through Continuing Education and this is a guiding document for what we're doing the next uh, year or two. We're also planning future forums on best practices and skills assessment and on a continuing education curriculum. Next. Among the things which are available to you, and I don't think we had any here this conference, uh, or if we did, they were all passed out early, but it's the IEEE catalog. And there, there was a list which people could sign on to get this sent to you, and that list, all the IEEE uh, documents, uh, books, conference proceedings, periodicals, courses that are available. Each year there are new titles added to that and uh, at least five new videos are available this year alone. Next. One of the uh, series of documents that the Education Activities has been putting out is called the Engineer's Guide to Business. 
And John mentioned the soft skills, reasons for failure of engineers being in the soft skills area. And these engineers guide the business, address that area. Uh, these are the volumes that are in print right now. Uh, and prior to this year, next slide please. And we're going to release four new titles in 1995. You can see them there. Uh, the starting to manage and working in a global environment will be out in the next, probably in October. And we may even release uh, marketing for engineers in uh, December. So we'll have 10 of these volumes available at the end of the year. Next. One of the projects which the Educational Activities Professional Development Committee is working on is the development of career guidance tools. This we are calling Career Asset Manager, or CAM. Next slide. As we now have the IEEE Financial Advantage Program, we expect to have a Career Advantage Program of which CAM, or Career Asset Manager, will be a part. The Career Advantage Program will include the Career Asset Manager, a lifelong learning curriculum, an educational resources database, a registry for keep a products and services database, and a registry for keeping track of continuing education units and professional development hours, uh, which engineers acquire as they take courses or attend technical uh, conferences or seminars. Planning is underway for a lifelong learning curriculum workshop to be held in 1996, and the Education Activities Department already has a registry available. You probably don't realize that, very few people do, but all you have to do is call the Education uh, Activities Department in Piscataway and you can register your CEUs. And we have received outside funding from the IEEE Foundation and the Engineering Foundation for the Career Asset Manager. And we have a group working on this tool which will provide the individual member with the means to plan a successful career. The format will be such the individual can adjust the plan as his or her career objectives change. Next slide. The concept of this career asset manager is that it will eventually be a disc or CD-ROM which will be as easy to use as the commercial financial program of Quicken. However, initially we're going to put it out in a notebook, sort of hard copy form to test and refine the concept. Next. This career asset manager, as presently visualized, will have three components. We will have a planning tool for long-term objectives and short-term career aims. And part of establishing these objectives is knowing where one is, where one has been, what skills one has, and what skills one needs to develop. So immediately preceding the USAP Biennial Careers Conference next April 11th and 12th in Minneapolis, which Peggy mentioned, EAB is sponsoring a skills assessment workshop to determine best practices in skills assessment. We'll take the output from that workshop and become, it will become part of CAM so that individuals can assess their own skills and see where they need to go. The documenting portion will allow the member to keep track of professional activities and job assignments, courses taken, seminars and conferences attended, papers given, community activities such as PTA and other volunteer activities such as Little League coaching and personal documents. Just an aside, John O'Shea mentioned that uh, Little League coaching provided him some skills in personal relationships. He had to deal with those kids that when he wouldn't play them where they wanted to play, they said they were going to quit and go home. Next day went into work and he was talking to his team and uh, one of the members got a little bit uh, 
touchy because they didn't play the game at work the way he wanted it played. And John used somewhat similar approaches to the first graders and the working engineers. So you can learn personal relation skills in your volunteer activities outside of IEEE. Uh, the information in the resources section will contain things that not just educational, but other things such as data from the salary survey. And there's a yellow survey form. I have seen it on the table in the foyer. It may be in this room also. There's a yellow survey form which we would like people to fill out to indicate what you think is important to include. Uh, also included will be things on career activities. The people working on this uh, career asset manager are not just IEEE members, not just engineers, but we also have some career development and human resources people such as people like Peggy. Next slide. Schedule is to have a paper version available in the winter of 96, which is about February. Anticipate a disk version being available in the winter of 97. And a year later, we hope to have an online version, but this depends somewhat on the success that they have in uh, getting the IEEE computer system fully operational so that we can use that. Of course, as all of you know, with any uh, product development, there will be design changes, and CAM is no different. But the career asset manager, the skills assessment workshop, and the lifelong development, lifelong learning curriculum development workshop are all based on action items from the Industry 2000, which John Meredith, one of our difference makers, chaired. Next slide. This shows the people you can contact in regard to any one of these items. Uh, and for general professional development in the Educational Activities Board, you can contact me. And for Educational Activities, Barbara Coburn, I have put up the uh, email addresses so that you can use those. And the more of your input we, pardon, that we get, the more likely the result will be a product that members uh, will find useful. And none of the, but none of these tools are going to be any good unless people use them. So just remember, as some of the others have said, that the information and material this morning, in fact all weekend, is intended not just for you, but to take back to your colleagues. And you're all to be messengers. No, more than that, you're to be evangelists for continuing education and developing professional development to maintain your resilient careers. Thank you.